Well, good morning, uh, everybody. This is a joint meeting between the House Ag Committee and the Senate Agricultural Committee. And I want to welcome you folks uh, to our, our joint meeting. Uh, this part of our meeting is covering um, rural Vermont and their issues, as well as Nova Vermont. And um, we've been quite busy uh, working in the committee uh, so far this year. Uh, I've done quite a lot of, on small farms or small plot, uh, <laughs> cannabis plots uh, for our farmers. And I expect we'll, we'll hear some updates on that. Uh, before um, we get started, uh, I'd like to have my committee introduce themselves, uh, Chris. Good morning, Chris Pearson, a senator from Chittenden. Morning, Anthony Polina, Washington County Senate. Ryan Coloma, representing the Rutland County District. Larry <clears throat> Parent, represent Franklin County in Alberg. Yeah, and I'm Bobby Starr, and I represent Orleans, Essex uh, counties, along with Richford. Montgomery and Wilcott. Uh, I'd like to, at this point, uh, introduce Carolyn Partridge from the chair of the House Committee. Uh, Carolyn. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Bobby. And I want to thank everybody for joining us today. And uh, we can introduce ourselves. We can go around the room, uh, starting with Rodney. That's Rodney Graham, with the <clears throat> uh, Orange One District, which is we have down Washington. <laughs> Orange, Chelsea, first year, correct? No, currently the vice chair. Heather, you want to go in and then we'll go to Terry? Heather, <laughs> not to represent the Windsor 4 1, just Barnard, Comfort, Queechy, and West Hartford. Uh, Terry Norris, the uh, Rutland Addison District, Benson, Orwell, Shoreham, and Whiting. Tom Bach, I represent the towns of Chester, Andover, Baltimore, <laughs> and uh, part of North Springfield. Representative Vicki Strong, and I represent Albany, Barton, Craftsbury, Greensboro, Glover, Wheelock, and Sheffield. <coughs> Henry Pearl, uh, Caledonia, Washington District, which is Danville, Peachum, and Cabot. John, you want to go? Hi, I'm John O'Brien. I represent Royalton in my hometown of Tunbridge. <coughs> and I'm Carol Partridge. I represent the towns of Athens, Brookline, Crafton. Part of North Westminster, all of Rockingham, and my hometown of Wyndham. And I want to thank you all for joining us today. I can't wait to hear uh, about your, an update from you all. And um, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you, Carolyn, and welcome uh, to all your House members. Um, we have a list of witnesses. I think maybe you, some of you folks have the list as well. Uh, hopefully all of you. Uh, and we'll uh, start this morning's testimony with uh, Mark Hedges. Morning, Mark. Hughes. Hughes. Mark Hughes, <laughs> Mr. Chair. Hughes. Well, this is exciting. <clears throat> For the record, my name is Mark Hughes. I'm Reverend Mark Hughes. I am the executive director of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance and Justice for All. I want to thank you, Mr. Chair, for inviting us uh, to the committee this morning. And um, I'm here not just representing uh, Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, but there is a Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition. Um, that coalition includes rural Vermont, as well as uh, NOFA Vermont. Um, the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, the Vermont Growers Association. And we also have um, a good friend of ours, Josh Decatur, who's the, the former um, CEO of uh, Trace, if, if you recall. We're going to be covering a, a number of topics. Um, I apologize in advance for um, not being able to be around with you uh, for the, the, the duration. I appreciate you front loading me on the agenda. We'll be talking about some social equity recommendations uh, that we've been pursuing for the last couple of years, uh, last year in S25 and the year prior in S54. 
Uh, definitely some great conversation we hope to have with you on uh, all outdoor cultivation, uh, direct sales uh, for producers, live plant sales, uh, increasing the allowance for home cultivation, um, amongst other uh, topics. So that's what we'll, we'll be covering collectively, though. There's also some constituencies, uh, some of our constituency um, that, that's out there that's going to be joining us. We're really, really happy uh, to bring you the voices from the community as well. Regarding the, um, the first topic, which is which really gets into this whole idea of um, the uh, social equity recommendations, um, one of the things that ECB uh, recently recommended was is that there be a 5% excise tax uh, to the Cannabis Development Fund, as well as a 20% 20 um, 20 to the community reinvestment. That's something, although there's probably um, maybe five or six policy bills that are floating around right now. We've yet to see that stick anywhere. Uh, so we're hoping that, you know, for not just in this joint committee, but obviously there's a cross pollination across the Senate into other committees and there's also relationships. Uh, we would just like some guidance on how we get that happening. Um, I think the, the main thing about this um, social equity fund uh, mm -hmm. and the funds that have been set aside for it through ACCD is, is that we want it to be um, sufficient and we want it to be sustainable. Uh, so perhaps there might be some thoughts that come out of this committee. Maybe uh, this committee might be able to give uh, some of the other uh, committees a nudge. You may recall in our, um, our um, moral budget memorandum that we sent over to you uh, last year, it was probably about 255, 355 days ago uh, we sent you a moral budget, um, and I'm I'm certain that every every uh, elected official on this call uh, received a copy of it. And I just wanted to just highlight one um, thing that we said there it was that we at the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance were we're proud to advocate for state policies that empower American descendants of slavery and Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, and and seek equity for these groups in our community. We believe that the, the racial reckoning that continues nationwide and in Vermont um, has the ability to bring the transformative change needed to reimagine our state systems uh, that, far, that have far too long um, uh, left uh, American descendants of slavery and BIPOC behind. Uh, we stand at an intersection of the compounding crisis of systemic racism and COVID-19. This crossroads represents, it presents an opportunity uh, to undergo the paradigm shift that's needed to disrupt and dismantle systemic racism in Vermont. So that is from that uh, memorandum. And I just, the reason why I brought that up is, is that we've, we have been uh, advocating for policies that uh, economically address uh, systemic racism across the state. Uh, that one was loaded uh, with them. The uh, Joint Finance Committee, uh, I, I testified to last evening, and some of this also came up there uh, with uh, upwards of uh, $3.5 billion that have come into the state uh, recently. Um, I think we can do better. Uh, so I would ask you to consider that 5% equity fund, um, the 20% community reinvestment, and how we get that moving. Um, I think that, um, again, we've, um, We've been we've been advocating for this for quite some time, and and um, currently right now we're still stuck at seven hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. I think there's a five hundred thousand dollar investment that comes out of the general general fund, and then there's a, another fifty thousand dollars that goes that comes out of each one of the uh, integrated license holders. Um, I know which committee I'm speaking to right now, uh, but I do believe that uh, you do have the influence, uh, you have the power uh, to affect change. Uh, to get that moving. Um, I want to also remind you of R113, which uh, you passed uh, last year. Um, in this resolution, uh, uh, you decided that you would um, make some moves relating to racism as a public health emergency. And so I, I just wanted to just remind you that one of the resolve clauses, it's, it's, it's resolved that the legislative body commits to quote, the sustained and deep work of eradicating systemic racism uh, throughout the state, actively fighting racist uh, practices and participating in the creation of more just and equitable systems. <laughs> and I will uh, leave that there. Now, 
I want to tie um, this whole conversation of, about uh, systemic racism together. Um, and I would like to read into the record uh, with, the, uh, with the chair's permission, um, a, um, a definition uh, that, that we have prepared. Um, you may know uh, that the work that we've been doing uh, brought about Act 54 in 2017, which created the RDAP, as well as Act 9 uh, 2018 in the special session, which created the Racial Equity Executive Director's Office. Um, you, you may recall last week that you did something historic. You decided to abolish slavery in the state of Vermont in PR2. And also that um, Act 33, uh, the health equity uh, policy is also something that came from the Racial Justice Alliance. And uh, that work is ongoing. Uh, what we have here is, is um, some commitment to the work around systemic racism, but not an, an agreed upon definition. And I thought it would be befitting today to share with you the definition that the Racial Justice Alliance uses and has used in this work. And I would love to read that into the record. And it, is, it states as follows, and I quote, uh, systemic racism involves both the deep structures in the surface structures of racial oppression. Uh, it includes a complex array of anti-Black practices, the unjustly gained political economic power of whites, the continuing economic and other resource inequalities along racial lines, and the emotion-laden racist framing created by whites to maintain and rationalize their privilege and power. It goes on to say that systemic racism thus encompasses the dominant white racial frame with its white racist attitudes, ideologies, emotions, images, narratives, as well as the discriminatory actions and institutions flowing out of and linked to that frame. Th this racism is material, social, and ideological reality, and indeed systemic, uh, which means that racist reality is, is manifested in all, um, it's, <clears throat> It's manifested in all major institutions. Um, and I quote it from uh, Racist America. This is Roots, um, Current Realities and Future Reparations. It's a book by Joe Fagan and uh, Kimberly Ducey. In closing, uh, I would just say that there is a, um, a, an ex inextricable connection that uh, our, our uh, fight for equity uh, as it pertains to race uh, has to that of uh, equity and farming. Um, I've been in Ver Vermont now for about 14 years. And as some of you, because uh, I've listened to your um, introductions in the areas in which you represent, um, you'd like, you may want to know I've, I've resided in, in Cabot, Vermont. And I, what I mean by Cabot is, is I'm talking um, past Marshfield Dam, up the hill on Route 2, uh, out there on the left, uh, before you get to Danville. I, I hope some of you know what I'm talking about. So I, I'm talking about the sticks. Um, I've also spent some time living in Woodbury, uh, and that's up on the hill on the other side of the golf course there, uh, back in the sticks. Uh, spent some time in Williamstown as well. Uh, so I've had plenty of opportunity uh, to, um, to hang out with my brothers and sisters across the state. I'm not just a, a flatlander that just blew in uh, from out of state and, um, and has been in Burlington the entire time. In fact, some of my better years have been in the sticks. Um, what I do know is, is that there's only one one percent, uh, and and what I what I also know and what I came to understand in in this fight uh, that this coalition has um, successfully put together. Um, my mother told me is, is you know that you have um, you have begun to make progress when people start picking on you, or else they start talking about you, or else they start giving you a hard time. Well, I think we set aside all of that criteria. Uh, we've made some noise. Uh, I think um, Senator Pearson would probably agree um, that we've, we've made some noise and we're going to continue making noise. We are together. Um, you know, the fight uh, for the LGBTQIA community, um, the fight for clean water, uh, the fight uh, for uh, against global warming, the fight uh, for equity in farming, the fight for racial justice, all of them are inextricably bound. Uh, we are not an uncommon alliance. In fact, we are a very common alliance, and I think you'll see this occurring more and more often. Um, I stand for what my colleagues stand for, and they stand for what we stand for. And uh, we're here uh, collaboratively 
um, and we're we're doing so with all of the effort that we know how um, to bring to your attention these challenges that create disparities in the rollout of this industry across Vermont. This is the first time in history that we have ever rolled out an industry in Vermont acknowledging that systemic racism is a thing. Uh, my hope is, is that we would take that into full account as we do this work. Mr. Chair, I thank you for your time this afternoon and those who have appeared uh, to, in this committee, those who represent in this committee, I thank you for your work. Um, I've, I've given a, a very extensive list of a lot of the work that has been done by this body uh, around some of these areas. I'm confident um, that we can continue to move this work forward. Thank you and have a great morning. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And we'll move right along uh, to Graham. Morning, Graham. Morning, Senator and committee members. Um, thank you for having us all today. And you know, this is the first of a few of our small farm advocacy days and it's, it's focused on, on Canvas this year. Um, so I really wanna make this space for, for a lot of the folks who came in here today to advocate for themselves, to tell you about why this is important to them um, and, and their roles in the upcoming marketplace, their concerns and ideas are. But I'm just gonna quickly run through some of, some of our main concerns. And I, I do hope that I'm able to talk with some of you all tomorrow morning again before S-188 moves from your committee or at another time soon, because there's been about two weeks of testimony with a lot of juicy stuff I'd love to respond to. But just real quick, you know, I think what Mark was just talking to, it, it's, I just wanna hammer home why that's important to agriculture. Um, as you know, given the present demographics of agricultural land ownership, the history of disinvestment and discrimination faced by bog plot communities, agriculture in rural areas all across the US, you see with the USDA right now providing, you know, compensatory payments for this discrimination, acknowledging it, et cetera. Um, but also those who've been disproportionately impacted by cannabis now. Um, I've included, I've talked to a number of farmers whose parents faced time in prison who were taken from their families. I've talked to one person who they, their family lost their farm there's a lot of damage that has been done in agricultural communities around these laws over time. Um, and that's why it's important to make sure there is ongoing funding for the Cannabis Development Fund that's currently not in statute. We kept being told to go back to the CCB and ask for what we thought was important. The CCB has now affirmed that this is very important. 5% of excise tax to the Cannabis Development Fund, 20% to reinvestment in communities. We just want the legislature to now act on that. Um, in terms of the ag stuff, you know, you know a lot of our points. I'm gonna really quickly just run through them and then let everyone else talk, but we think all outdoor cultivation should be agricultural and not just the smallest tier and not just those that are, are already agricultural. Um, I think it's really important to think about the repercussions uh, given what we were just talking about. If you only make this for folks who are already ag, um, 98, 99% of the, the agricultural land owned in Vermont is owned by people who identify as white. Um, it's not, this isn't about, um, any punitive measures towards folks who are white, so we're just recognizing that there's, if you don't provide those same privileges for other folks, and given the real challenges yeah. of access to land right now, that we really make, make room and have parity for everybody who wants to grow this crop outside. Um, some of the other concerns, as you know, are actually 50 compliance, the reality of having separate buildings, vehicles, equipment for crops that are agricultural and things that are not. Um, and you've been talking a lot about federal enforcement and the risks there. And you know, I think all cannabis establishments face the uncertainty of federal persecution. Farms are, will be some of the least visible in the state. Think about all the other ones in urban areas that will be actively selling product um, and advertising. Um, you know, I don't think to our knowledge that um, giving farms the, all the exemptions that would otherwise be called agricultural would make them any more likely to be persecuted. And if this is the case, and if what legislative council said is true, like we just re recommend that the legislature and CCB really draft guidance and outreach to all establishments so they can know how to protect themselves. Um, direct sales, extremely important. As you know, we've talked about a lot. Um, I can talk more with you about the cultivator stuff uh, related to live plant sales in the future and about increasing the allowance um, for home scale producers. But right now, I'd really like to just pass it on to the folks who, who've really given, are here to give you their time today and talk about their stories. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Graham. Uh, Jeffrey? I don't know. Who's this? Um, Jeffrey, unfortunately, was not able to join us this morning. Um, sounds like he is feeling under the weather. So I think, um, I think I'm next on the list after Jeffrey, um, but beyond me, I'd also like to cede my time to some of the other folks who are here um, it looks like maybe the next person that we have on the agenda who I think is here is uh, Kyle, I believe. I think that the name says Kyle. 
Okay, Kyle Peck. Hello, let me try to get my camera turned on here. This is Patricia, Kyle's wife. Hi, I don't know if you can see me now. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm here representing our, good morning, thank you for having us and we appreciate your time. Um, I'm here representing Mystic Mountain Cannabis. We're out of Bristol, Vermont. We are a family owned, veteran operated small business, hopefully entering the cannabis market here come May 1st. Um, I don't have like any talking points today per se. I'm just trying to be involved with the legislation and represent this market in a positive manner. Um, and I don't really have much to say other than I really appreciate your time. And I hope that um, if you have any questions about, you know, how we plan to stay within compliance or anything, um, I hope I can answer that for you. Well, thank you, uh, Patricia. We'll, we'll get some questions for you after everyone testifies. Jen, is Jen Jen's with us. Morning. Good morning. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, it's great to see both the House and Senate committees here today, along with my fellow farmers and advocates. Uh, for the record, my name is Jen Daniels. I reside in Colchester, and I am president and co-founder of Marison Farms. Uh, having farmed hemp commercially for three years, both in the NEK and in Shelburne, um, specifically Irisburg. Before I became a hemp farmer and business owner in Vermont, I worked for over 20 years in public service, in community development, race relations, and as a landscape architect, designing public spaces to promote social equity. From that experience, I learned that one of the most important factors in supporting social equity, probably the most important, is meaningful economic opportunity. So not just so people can get by, but to have a real chance to create abundance and build intergenerational wealth. <laughs> I've seen it in my work with Native American communities in the Southwest and indigenous communities abroad. And I've also seen it in my work with black and brown or global majority neighborhoods in Connecticut and Washington, DC. I am seeing it all too clearly here in Vermont. And as you all know, as land skyrockets in value and transfers out of productive use, the problem is only getting worse. The launch of Vermont's new cannabis market is a historic moment for developing that kind of meaningful economic opportunity, especially in outdoor cultivation, where those who lack access to large amounts of capital have a real shot at creating that abundance and building uh, inter intergenerational wealth. And at the same time, which I know is very important to this committee, preserving working lands. As we just listened to previously, um, uh, listening to the Working Lands um, Enterprise yeah. Initiative. But that opportunity will be lost if the barriers to access are not removed. Um, and I'd like to share two solutions to those barriers today. First, um, something I think Brand just mentioned, all outdoor cultivation must be considered farming under state law and thus not restricted by Act 250 and local zoning. Such restrictions have been used all too often to not only restrict access, but as a tool of racial discrimination. And we can look at the history on that. And it's not enough to do that only for small cultivators. The small cultivation tiers are not a means to build abundance and intergenerational wealth, particularly outdoors. And the environmental and zoning impact of outdoor cannabis farming is really is no different from hemp, which is considered farming at any scale in Vermont. And the impacts really aren't much different from any other type of farming either. The second solution that I'd like to share with you, in my opinion, to those barriers is that the state needs to support community land trusts and other alternative models to land ownership and land access. I know there's a fantastic report in Farm to Plate all about this. Um, and again, I wanna reiterate as land values skyrocket, this is becoming increasingly necessary to ensure access to those without large amounts of capital, not just in canna but cannabis, but in all agriculture. Four years ago, I left the public service and moved to Vermont to start a hemp farming business because of Vermont's working land ethic and the economic opportunity that this presented for men <laughs> and our three teenage kids. And um, we have privilege because we are white. 
I'm going to say that again. We have privilege because we are white and had some access to modest capital get started. States all over the country are struggling to get social equity right, whatever that means, in cannabis. But because of Vermont's commitment to working lands, economic opportunity, and racial and social justice, we have a golden opportunity right now to become a model for the nation in how this can work. Thank you so much for your time and thank you Royal Vermont and NOFA and um, Vermont Racial Justice Alliance for creating this opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Jan. Um, we have, is it, um, add your, add? Uh, Eduardo yeah, go Jaime. ahead. <laughs> yeah, Eduardo Jaime, you can call me Ed if you'd like, that, that seems to be easier for people. Um, that's my name. Uh, Together with my friend uh, in Randolph, uh, we are Fine Bud Farms. Um, we're vegetable and cannabis farmers. You know, I, I've worked on farms um, in my late teens, you know, my early 20s. I continue to play with soil and plants. Um, I, I, I do want to say I'm a recent, I'm a fairly recent Vermont uh, tra transfer in here, having moved from North Carolina where I was a paramedic and uh, were many, many great small farmers. Um, I came at the beckon, beckoning of my friend. Um, I'd like to thank, you know, VGA, NOFA, Rural Vermont, uh, the Racial Justice Alliance, um, and many others for their efforts. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, you, the committee, uh, for hearing me today, hearing my colleagues, um, and also thank you for the work that you're doing. You know, I know it's not, uh, it's not easy with cannabis's federal status. You know, I've, I've been watching y'all uh, and, you know, I'm very impressed, very happy uh, that y'all are in charge here. But uh, all that being said, I'd like to speak on um, S-188. Uh, it's, cause it's a crucial piece of legislation, you know, that can ensure a cannabis marketplace that represents the small farmers in the state, uh, particularly those that have already been growing, you know, as part of the underground market. Um, unfortunately, you know, cannabis's commercial status triggers Act 250, you know, as, as many people have already said, and, and for many small farmers across the state, um, <clears throat> you know, not to mention the other regulations that they could be subjected to, whether municipal or like, you know, it's, it's, it's a cumbersome process, you know, having gone through a majority of it myself, you know, I, I can attest to that, and uh, I can attest that it will be a barrier you know, for, for many talented small farmers, whether it's self-imposed financial or, you know, people just don't have the time. It's a very time consuming process. And then once it's filed, you know, from there it goes, it goes on and, and, and uh, travels on down that pipeline. Um, so uh, as, as they've already said, you know, I think outdoor cultivation as well should be regulated as, as farming or, or somehow regulated as, as you stated the other day, I think under the CCB, so as to kind of circumnavigate that whole federal thing. Um, I think that's a great idea, you know, so it, it, it'll ease the burden on small farmers. And, and we do know that it is farming, right? You know, the stigma should end. Um, and also tying into that as, as farmers already in the state do, and they sell plants, they sell seeds, you know, they sell their products to one another and the public. Uh, I feel cannabis cultivators should have that same ability without the need for a retail or wholesale license. That's, it's, it's not required for any other farm-based products. Um, so one of the things I've come to love about this state really is its seeming dedication to farmer sovereignty, you know, which is something that I've seen lost in, in, in many places. You know, it's happening all across this nation, you know. And uh, I would love to see cannabis CSAs, farmers markets, you know, farm stores selling their harvests. Um, direct sales of one's own products is paramount, I think, for a just and equitable market that puts the power in the hands of small Vermont farmers rather than giant corporations that could really care less about those small farmers or selling a subpar product to the public. You know, as small farmers, we, we take pride in our craft and we want to share that with people. Um, I, and, and I'd also like to take this time to address personal cultivation. You know, I feel a higher plant count is more realistic and consistent with what's already happening. You know, with farming, you got to count for losses. Having higher plant counts can, can allow for a home grower to mitigate that and other mishaps that might come up. Um, also, you know, as a cultivator, I, I love to be able to, to have direct access to those home growers and, and give them, you know, clones and, and seeds if, if they would like. 
Um, you know, again, destigmatization of the plan is necessary. And lastly, uh, I, I'd like to recommend, you know, um, putting the social equity recommendations from the CCB in the statute, as well as reiterating with Reverend Hughes and Graham and Jen all stated, um, you know, we all know that communities of color have been disproportionately impacted by the failed war on drugs. And that criminalization of cannabis to begin with was, you know, racially motivated. So I, I believe it a necessity that money be reinvested in those communities from taxes collected, you know, it's long overdue. And, and once again, to reiterate what Jen said, and, and in my opinion, you know, this is a very real chance to have a recreational market unlike any other in the country, you know, of, of the people, you know, by the people and for the people, as they say. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you so much for your time and thank you very much for your work. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much, Ed. Um, we have Matt uh, up next. Uh, you're muted, Matt. <clears throat> Uh, good morning. Can you hear me now? Yes. Good. Awesome. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, thank you to Nova for putting this on. Uh, certainly all of your efforts and, and everything involved in this are, are highly appreciated. The time and labor that's gone into this. Uh, I'm probably going to reiterate some of the points that have been uh, eloquently said ahead of me, uh, as I think they need to kind of be beaten here a little bit. Um, so I'm Matt Leonetti. I moved to Vermont in 2000. I've uh, been involved in agricultural pursuits here uh, ever since. Um, I own and run with my partner uh, an organic, certified organic uh, hemp operation in year five. I also work for Clean Green, which is the nationally largest nationally recognized certifying body for cannabis and has been since 2004 uh, with standards that go far above the USDA baseline. Um, I am also a convicted felon for cannabis and was facing 127 years for cultivation in the 90s. Uh, so I am well aware of the impacts uh, of the war on drugs. Uh, even to this day, uh, 25 years past my conviction, I still had the amount of scrutiny that I had to go through to simply be the tree warden for the town of Richmond and to even coach rec soccer is ridiculous. So the impacts are extremely real and they are still tailing a lot of us to this day. So I am all for a lot of social equity components and I think these need to be put in the statute. This was a key cornerstone of legislation going into this to work to remand some of and repatriate some of the, the badness of all of this war on drugs and how that has impacted communities and disadvantaged folks and everyone else and myself included for all of us. Um, so this is a huge key to me, and it's very important. It needs to be addressed, um, and I think it would help and support encouraging community, which I think we, in this day and age we've kind of lost. We need to go back and rebuild community. So when I think of Vermont, I see this beautiful landscape. It's a patchwork of family farm, maple syrup, cheese, meat, vegetables. That is what Vermont represents to me. And even though I wasn't born here, that's how I see it. Small family niche farm. Cannabis plays into this absolutely perfectly well. So let's look at our farmers now. Farming is a, a razor thin margin of profit or loss. Right now we have an opportunity through the cannabis industry to create a level of wealth that we're never gonna have an opportunity to have here in Vermont again. Vermont's a tough state to make it in, honestly. We all know this. We have the fifth highest taxes in the state. We're a very rural state with not a lot of big business, not a lot of big paying jobs. They don't come here. They go across the lake for the tax incentives. So right now with cannabis, we have an opportunity not only to bring a lot of people that actually really care about being land stewards and cultivating cannabis in an extremely clean and craft way, but the level of wealth that we could bring to Vermont to rebuild our communities, to rebuild our families. This opportunity is not coming again. You're not gonna see another crop do this. In two years, Maine, one crop is now the largest crop and it's cannabis. This is a very powerful plant, got a lot of healing properties and we should do it right. So I think when we look at you know this, cannabis is an agricultural pursuit. It is grown just like any other crop and probably has more care put into it than a lot of other crops. So to say that cannabis is not an agricultural pursuit, I think if we look at the definition of what Vermont has actually defined as farming, cannabis absolutely falls into that. 
Um, so I believe that the barriers here, Act 250 and all these separate buildings, again, these are barriers to entry because the cost of getting into this is ridiculous. I think we need to think about rebuilding our communities and allowing, this was supposed to be a market that was inclusive and equitable. Let's allow it to be that by, again, removing some of these barriers that would allow other folks into it. Again, we have a farming landscape and these farmers operate and have great interactions with clients through direct access. Cannabis farmers should absolutely have that same respect and opportunity to have direct access to those folks that wanna support them. Know your farmer, get to talk to them, look at them in the eye. We should have that same thing. And that is also what builds community. And that's also what we're trying to do here. On top of building an industry, let's rebuild the community fabric of this state. Um, <clears throat> You know, another big one for me is the, the home grow plant numbers. I think they're absolutely ludicrous. If you actually sit down and do the math, there's no way a cancer patient has enough material to grow their own medicine in a year. So I am all for upping these plant counts. I think they should be up significantly. We have not seen any undue and bad response by allowing home grows at this point. And again, this isn't an empowerment thing of people. So let's empower the people if they want to grow their own or if they want to support a regulated industry. So again, let's give them the option to have the amount of plants that they should. I also think, again, that CSA model, farmers should be allowed to sell their plants directly to consumers. We don't need wholesalers and retailers to be those middlemen. Let the farmer have direct access and let him keep the profits to build the wealth, to build the community, to rebuild the family. And I think on that, you know, the one thing I would really like, we really have to think about this, and this has been beaten into us constantly through all these years of, of working on this, is the fact that this should be a, an equitable and inclusive market. And there are still so many things in these bills that don't allow that to happen. Again, we don't get a second shot at this opportunity. And I think what we can create here and what we can model, because we're a small state and we have a more unique opportunity than the bigger states, is absolutely amazing. So I really would like you guys to listen to us, to hear us, to take these to heart and really think about how you have an opportunity to create something for Vermont that you might not get an option to do again. Um, and this is through an agricultural pursuit which represents the social fabric and the beauty of the state. So I appreciate the time that you've allowed me to speak this morning. I appreciate all of your efforts. Thank you to NOFA, VGA, Vermont, everyone else that's here. Great comments. Thank you for your time. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Well, thank you, Matt. Um, <clears throat> do we have another Matt that here to testify? I think we had someone signed up, but I don't see him here. Um, so I think we can move on to the next witness. So Josh is up next. Hello, everyone. Um, I have a slightly unstable connection, so I'm just going to be uh, going over voice. Um, my name is Joshua Decatur. Uh, good to see many of you uh, again. I've testified here before and in some other councils. Um, as background, I was the founder of TRACE, which is the track and trace system facilitating the Vermont Hemp Program. And I'm also a member of the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition. Um, we've been working together for well over a year, year and a half, maybe more now. Um, uh, bringing all of our organizations together uh, to focus on equity in cannabis and all the intersectional issues. Um, I've heard a lot of great testimony today um, from community members and, and members of our coalition. So you know, I'm going to keep it short and sweet and focus on a, a piece of the story here that I think uh, you know may be missing right now. Um, so last time we spoke, uh, I think last year, um, you know, the emerging cannabis market was more or less a corporate handout. And the reality is that it, it still is. Um, you know, in some months, vertically integrated companies will be able to run their businesses and sell product to Vermonters and will have no imperative to support Vermont agricultural communities, Vermont farmers, uh, or, or be proactive members of our community in any way. Um, 100% of those vertically integrated permits are owned by out-of-state companies 
um, two of them publicly traded. Um, and, you know, every single dollar that goes over the, the counter in the, the first retailers in Vermont currently will be going out of state. It's for reasons like this that it's so important to allow things like direct on sale farms. But honestly, if uh, the legislature was brave and stood up for the interests of the people of Vermont, they would actually intervene in the timeline of the market rollout itself. Um, Vermonters have struggled and suffered within the medical program in the state, more or less since its inception, due to companies not really having an interest to care for their patients, um, instead only having profit incentives. And they've told narratives publicly that portrayed them as struggling companies that invested a lot, that did not have an opportunity uh, or, or you know, a return in their investment um, that uh, was worthy of the investments they made in the state. And that was used as justification to give them early access to the emerging market. Um, you know, we know now with more time that that's simply not true. These companies had different tax obligations that forced them to run their companies at a loss and pay out money through consulting agreements to other entities. So they were making money the whole time. I just want to put that on record. Um, no, there's been a lot of people in the, in the community parading around cannabis legalization as if, uh, you know, championing it as a, as a progressive win in the state. But the reality is the market currently is not progressive in any way. It's actually regressive. Um, if you look at it, uh, access to Vermonters is going to be very difficult. And first mover advantages are very significant in any emerging market. And right now they're going to, as I said, a, a select group of large companies. Small farmers, BIPOC Vermonters are being left out. They'll still have opportunities for sure. And it's important to codify social equity uh, you know, rules that have been put in place, but they're going to be fighting against a tide um, that right now, uh, and they're going to be fighting against rules in a market structure that right now is not in their interest unless there's some kind of intervention from the legislature um, with respect to many of the issues you've, you've heard today. Uh, treating cannabis as an agricultural product, permitting uh, on-farm sales uh, for producers, direct, direct sales and direct purchases for consumers, increasing home cultivation plant counts, uh, enabling live plant sales um, for cultivators and nurseries, um, you know, et cetera. So, um, you know, with that, I would just urge all of you to please stand up for the people of Vermont and the interests of small farmers and everyday Vermonters and the BIPOC community in the state over the interest of a, of a small group of out-of-state companies. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Josh. Um, we have um, Ben, Ben, Ben Molcox. Yep. Hi, uh, my name is Ben Wilcox. Um, I own and operate Off Piece Farm, which is in Sutton, um, small town in the Northeast Kingdom. And uh, thank you a lot for having me today. Thanks uh, for doing the work to support Vermont agriculture. And also thanks to the Vermont Cannabis Equity Coalition for um, inviting me to talk about my experience in cannabis in Vermont. Um, I've been growing hemp since 2018. Uh, I grow about a half an acre um, for the first three years. And then last year I dropped it down to a quarter acre. Um, and I've seen, uh, you know, just in the four years um, in the hemp business, which I mostly grow for high CBD flour, which is not similar to how one would grow for high THC flour in an outdoor setting. Um, you know, the very first year I, was able to sell my whole crop at wholesale price and uh, did well enough to get excited to grow again the next year. Um, and then the next year, a lot of people grew and the price fell. And it's been a little bit of a struggle ever since then to compete with larger operations who can grow more volume and seem to be able to sell at a lower price. Um, but difficult for, for me as a kind of a sole proprietor to compete with that. And so I've been trying to experiment with other ways to make some generate some revenue um, through growing hemp, which kind of my goal when I started was to try to 
make a little bit of income off of my land. Um, I also do carpentry work and stuff as well um, and teach ski lessons and stuff like that. But as far as the hemp operation goes, I decided to try to start offering pick your own hemp, um, which the first year was during the pandemic. And that I said a couple people come, but it didn't do as good as I was hoping. Um, I did it again last year and I had um, several more people come and purchase plants out of the field. And uh, it was exciting to talk directly with the consumers who came. They were all really uh, interested in, in CBD. They all use it for medicine. And um, my crop is certified organic. And they were all really excited to be able to come pick up an uh, organic plant to go uh, medicine with. Um, that was that it was also exciting for me to talk directly with consumers and people who will be using the plants that I work to grow. Um, and I'd like to continue doing that. And, and it would be great to be able to do something more for THC cannabis. People also use that for medicine. And you know, for, for me to be able to grow quality plants and then sell directly to them would be great. Um, I also started offering hemp farm tours of my operation. Again, generally the people that came um, were people that were interested in cannabis cultivation, interested in this new marketplace, <laughs> asked a lot of questions about it. And um, it was fun for me to interact with them also and just talk about this new industry and what I've learned over the last four years. And um, one of the things I love about the, the business of growing these plants and cultivating is that I learn a lot every year. Uh, the learning curve doesn't seem to really slow down and, um, you know, you, you're putting seeds in the ground or starting plants and growing them through the summer and harvesting and selling them. I mean, that's, it's an exciting kind of long-term process that, uh, that I've really come to enjoy. Um, so the temp farm tours were great. And then I also started, I built a couple of campsites last summer on my property, some tent platforms. Um, you know, we have a fair amount of people come to our area in the summer who are here for mountain biking, thanks to the Kingdom Trails Association. I'm, I'm fairly close to East Burke. And um, I thought, in, in, you know, there's people, the, there was a shortage of tent camping sites and cheap places for pay, pay people to stay. Um, so I offered these sites for pretty low prices. Um, and I, people came pretty much every weekend and some of them came on my hemp farm tours and some of them also bought um, CBD oil from me and things like that. And my, you know, one of, my, one of the challenges I've had through growing hemp is trying to sell my crop. Um, and I've gone around the state to different stores and tried to directly sell the store owners. And that's, um, you know, it's a challenge and you have to make a lot of transactions that way to even sell just a half acre worth. So I thought having people come camp on my farm and doing these tours and maybe being able to sell a little bit directly to them at a higher profit margin, um, again, because the wholesale price is so low you know, because of the large producers that, uh, you know, selling directly to consumers at retail price, there's considerably better margins there. Um, and I also uh, <laughs> think being able to sell live plants and seeds too would be awesome um, as a way to diversify income for <laughs> small cultivators uh, in the springtime. There's, I know a lot of people around here just in my, you know, Sutton's a small town, it's about a thousand people. Um, the neighboring towns are also relatively small and as a small hemp grower I've gotten a little bit of a some of the local people have asked me about plants in the spring um, and I have been able to I usually just give them away because it's like a couple plants and I usually have extra anyways but um, that could be another way to help diversify for small growers to generate some revenue in the springtime and it could be you know any little bit helps um, and it could be enough to help pay for some temporary labor in the spring when, when you need it for planting plants and whatnot. Um, so all those things would really help. And, uh, you know, keeping the outdoor cultivation as, you know, since you are growing plants and harvesting, selling raw plant material, I mean, it is farming really, I think as far as, I don't know the legal definition or whatever, but it seems like it is to me and keeping the various entry small is going to help, you know, anyone be able to join the market and, uh, hopefully have a shot at, you know, keeping the reputation of Vermont as producing high quality um, agricultural, you know, high quality produce, you know, essentially produce. So um, yeah. that's about, I'd love to take, answer any questions yeah. you want to know about small outdoor cultivation. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, Maddie, do we have anyone else that's come along that, that we haven't called on? We do, yeah, thank you, Chair Starr. We have um, 
Charlotte and Janet um, joined us kind of last minute. So appreciate them being here. And then I'm happy um, before we wrap to offer some, just a few closing words. Um, and we have one other producer who is on the list, um, Matt Steinke. Sounds like he is trying to get to a place where he has internet access to join us. So he might join us as well. So um, we'll go to Charlotte uh, next. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, good, morning. good morning. It's so nice to be here. I am. Um, my name is Charlotte Rootbloom. My husband and I own a tiny um, emerging permaculture farm in Duxbury, right in the center of the state, just east of Camel's Hump. Um, we both grew up in Vermont. I, I've known some of you for my whole life. Nice to see you. Uh, gone to high school with you and uh, and your kids, um, and uh, and my husband grew up in um, I, I grew up in uh, Callis. My husband grew up in Heinsburg. We both left the state for a long time and are thrilled to be back here and to be participating in the stewardship of the this this um, incredible state. Um, I just like to take a moment to presence us in the conversation. Um, cannabis is a plant that humans have been cultivating for almost 30,000 years. Um, and the reason is because it has a special magic that creates a symbiotic relationship with human beings. Um, humans have what's called an endocannabinoid system in their bodies, which helps to maintain homeostasis in our immune systems and nervous systems and digestive systems, uh, in our brain chemistry, um, helps to combat men mental and physical illness and um, de degradation due to age and all kinds of things. And in our, um, in our uh, life, lifetime as humans, we <laughs> use cannabis to help supplement our endocannabinoid systems to uh, help us reach homeostasis more often. And as our um, environment degrades and our uh, capitalist systems take such a toll on our mental health and, um, and our communities, especially during um, a pandemic, I think it's essential that we recognize <laughs> the place of cannabis in helping us to um, supplement our ability to maintain any level of mental and physical health, which our societies are not designed to do in general. I think cannabis is, is a beautiful and amazing herbal medicine that, that we've been partnering with for much, much longer than we've been having this conversation in this state. And I think it's really important that we empower individuals in our state to treat themselves using herbal medicine my husband and I share uh, six different chronic illnesses. And we struggle with pain and depression and anxiety, autism, um, ADHD, <laughs> um, and autoimmune illnesses. And we use a lot of cannabis to help us try to reach homeostasis, but I am still disabled. I'm still not able to work a regular job outside of the home. I experience a ton of pain every day, nausea, um, along with my men mental illness struggles. Uh, my, my husband is still able to work outside of the, the home. Um, so we have a, a very small income and we're, we're still trying to figure out how we're going to make our farm solvent. And that's the next subject that I'd like to get to, which is um, financial independence for Vermonters and for Vermont. I think that cannabis, the plant, contains within it an incredible opportunity for us to empower individual land stewards and our communities and Vermont as a state to create a level of financial safety for Vermonters, which we are not currently providing. The cost of land is not within reach for Vermonters. The cost of farming is not within reach for Vermonters, and it's an incredibly unfair system for anyone who loves the land and wants to create a deep connection with it for a lifelong relationship of stewardship and preservation 
which is what me and my husband would love to do. We are diversified. We're attempting to create a permaculture farm. So we'll have, we have animals and uh, we cultivate cannabis for our own use at this time. And I also am the, um, we're founding an organization called Vermont Cannabis Coaching to try and help people understand the role that cannabis can play in our lives and in our connection to um, health, mental and physical homeostasis <clears throat> and financial um, independence. So that's, so that's two things. There's one is the, the deep connection to health that we have with the cannabis plant as human beings. And, and that endocannabinoid system is something that exists in all vertebrates. So it's not just human beings that have this deep connection to the cannabis plant. And then the, the second is financial uh, independence for Vermonters. And for Vermont, I think it's really, really important that you understand that farming is not within financial reach. Land is not within financial reach for Vermonters. And it's really, I, I, as, um, as lawmakers, I'd like you to just take a moment to embrace your role as visionaries and to just picture in your mind what the future could be like if we empowered Vermonters, independent Vermonters and not corporations in order to, to take this relationship with the land to the level that will benefit our communities and our state. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah, <laughs> thank you, Sean. The farm. Um, Janet, is Janet here? Sounds like Janet just um, just joined to listen. Um, and I oh. also uh, forgot to mention that Graham had some testimony uh -huh. um, that was submitted to him from someone that wanted to have it read, if we can. <laughs> um, yeah, we we aren't going to have much time for many questions, <clears throat> but. Uh, um, if that's the way you'd like to do it, that's fine. I Graham? Think, yeah, I think that can be brief and then I don't really have too much to add. So I think we'll have a little bit of time. Yeah, Graham? Yeah, thank you, Senators. Um, so this was a testimony submitted to me by a cultivator who I've been speaking with at times who didn't feel comfortable being here today. And I just wanted to make sure I, I made time to read it. First of all, so I'm from here on out, these are not my words, these are this person's words. <clears throat> First of all, a big thank you to all the people involved in this extremely comp complex and fraught regulated marketplace rollout. Your diligence and work is appreciated by those of us still unable or unwilling to speak directly and have our voices heard. As a multi-generational legacy cultivator who has experienced the impact of the war on drugs, I have been reluctant to be vocal or public about my intentions to enter the recreational market. I know I'm on this. While I look forward to the coming recreational market, I am also apprehensive. I am unclear as to why there are divisions among activities that are traditionally housed under one roof. There's a longstanding practice of hash making using ice, dry ice, or screens to produce limited batches of hash and pressed oil that reflect the unique qualities of a crop. Hashish and rosin making coupled with pre-rolled joints <clears throat> and material grown by the cultivator are some of the most traditional ways for small scale craft producers to increase their margins through value added products. As I understand the proposed guidelines, these activities are manufacturing and are to be separated physically from cultivation businesses, as well as being registered as a separate business. This poses a myriad of problems around accounting, branding, employee handling, tracking software, real estate management, etc. And some questions he's written. Will craft producers be able to make hash, rosin, and other value-added products under their own roof using their own material? This would represent the same model as a farmer making jam or some such value-added material on their farm site. If so, will the tracking software make managing both under one entity possible? Will the quote unquote manufacturing areas have to be distinct and separate from the quote unquote cultivation space? Will the quote unquote manufacturing and quote unquote cultivation businesses require separation of books and employees? Why isn't growing plants indoors considered agriculture if growing outdoors might be? Where can one gain clarity on the energy consumption guidelines? Many farmers from the legacy market are not used to using LEDs, and this will create a bigger, greater hurdle for them as it requires a different skill set and therefore a learning curve. How is the 280 e-tax law being taken into consideration? Thank you for your consideration of these matters. That's the end of the written testimony. And I, I just quickly say my own editorial here is I realized that a lot of these details were written into our part of the rulemaking for the CCB. But I think what this communicates hopefully to you all is the real complexity that people are, are that, this, that this market has inherently and the, some of the challenges and questions that people are facing when they're trying to understand how to run a small business or transition their legacy business into a, a regulated business. 
Yeah. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Graham. Uh, Maddie. Yeah, yeah I, um, in the interest of time, I, well, I'd love to open it up to questions, Senator Starr, um, to your point to give time for that. So we can just go straight to that if you want. Yep. <clears throat> um, we have, uh, Carolyn, you're going to have to let me know on your house members can hardly see you <laughs> folks on the screen, but Brian, okay. uh, Senator Collimore has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I deeply appreciate the testimony I've heard today. Um, I want you to know that from each and every one of you that have given up some of your time today to testify. Concern was expressed early on as we entered this regulated market about us in the legislature making sure we didn't open up the possibility of large corporate entities coming into the state, buying land, and growing cannabis, that we instead wanted to focus on small farming operations. So my question today is, can someone give me an idea of how that is defined? The CCB has identified six different tiers, which begin at 1,000 square feet and go up to 37,500 5, 37, feet, which is still under an acre, of course, and there's a plant differentiation with each of those tiers starting at 125 plants. I guess if you do the math, it comes out to 4,600 plants for the largest tier that they're going to regulate. My question again, and I'm, I'm, I'm serious about this, what's a small farm? At what point does it become a large farm, which would be of concern? Uh, any answers to that? Jen, uh, I think you're trying to answer. Well, um, unfortunately or fortunately, my better half uh, did the math on this and actually is his uh, information is what the Cannabis Control Board has currently um, adopted into their proposal. Um, I could ask him to come on screen and answer that question if that is okay. Maddie, I know you're, I don't want to derail, uh, but it would answer, help to answer that question. Are you all right with that, Maddie? I'm, I'm fine with that. And then it looks like Graham might want to respond also, but let's start with you, Jen. Is that okay? Okay. Well, with your permission, um, I'd be happy to introduce um, Rick Fox is my partner, both husband and business partner. So here. Yeah. And he'll be brief. So others have time to um, add, Graham. I'll be very brief. Yeah. Uh, and, good morning, uh, Rick. Uh, good, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, thank you. This is a great event. Um, but would, would someone please repeat the question? I literally what, just walked in the room. What's a small, what's considered a small farm and explaining the plant counts from Senator Colomar. So um, in, in terms of what's considered a small farm, uh, if you look at what other states do for uh, cultivation, uh, uh, even at the very largest tier envisaged at all by the Cannabis Control Board, this would be a small farm in any other state uh, at the highest level. So, um, you know, the tier five outdoor uh, as currently proposed, I believe is 2,500 plants. Um, that would be minuscule in any other state. Um, you know, that, uh, you know, you can fit that uh, quantity of plants uh, on less than an acre, uh, you know, uh, depending on spacing. Um, and even at the 4,188, which uh, I think is uh, being considered at, at, a, at a higher tier six level that I, the board may, may be holding off on for this year. I don't want to speak for the board. I just know what I've heard. They are. Yep. Um, even, even that would be very, very small. So uh, the, those numbers are based on um, uh, equivalent productive capacity. Uh, so uh, a thousand square feet indoor uh, can produce about 62 and a half pounds in 50 days. So our, our outdoor growing season is 100 days. So the outdoor equivalent of that would be 125 pounds. Yeah. And the general rule of thumb is, we all hope, um, is, is a pound per plant. You know, that's, that's an optimistic number, as we've learned in three years of outdoor cultivation of cannabis for hemp. Uh, so uh, in, in productive equivalency, 1,000 square feet is equivalent to 125 plants outdoors. Uh, and we encourage the board to carry that through the rest of the tiers because, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, with, with yields being lower, 
um, and, and, and uh, final product value typically lower for sun grown compared to indoor, uh, you really, uh, it, it's hard to actually have a viable outdoor cultivation business uh, with 125 plants. Um, so, I mean, you know, you can try, but to give that flexibility to the higher tiers is crucial. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, so um, how, how are we considered favoring corporate agriculture or big growers if, if even at our largest size that the board has allowed, it's still considered small most everywhere else in the country. So that's my question back to the people. We've had several speakers say, well, what we're doing here in Vermont is favoring the corporate company, big growers. And so I, I'd like to feel where we went wrong by allowing uh, allowing the sizes that are before us um, in the in the law so that we could maybe help fix it. Um, so um, Graham, did you want to get take a bite that apple? <laughs> I would love to take a bite that apple. My daughter really loves apples right now, so it's funny me thinking about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, a couple of things. Um, you know, one, I really appreciate the response just given. Um, so, Senator Starr, I think the point is that, you know, we, we really do think that the limited horizontal um, integration is really helpful at limiting the ability for folks to come in and take unfair market advantage. We really do appreciate the scales of outdoor production limitations that have been permitted. And like this last respondent says, we, we do feel like those are all small, relatively small. But where the, the, um, the issues come in is all the barriers to accessing those actual scales of production that were just, were just talked about by everybody. And two, the current market timeline and the current handing over of the market through that timeline to these vertically integrated corporations, which will have first moving in the market as Josh described, um, and the advantages that, that early market movers get in marketplaces in general, um, and the ownership of those, th those, the only people who can have that vertically integrated business are all multi-state operators, two of them publicly traded companies. So again, this gets back to the timeline and that inherent structure and some of the barriers to people actually taking advantage of some of these relatively small scales of farming. That would be my response. Um, other questions in Carol and do you, uh, John O'Brien has a question. Sure, go ahead, John. Thank you. Uh, since there are a lot of witnesses here today with, with um, experience growing both hemp and cannabis, I just wondered both sort of from a, a plant perspective, but also thinking of CSAs or farm stands, uh, what, what, how do they compare as far as what you could get you know, sort of an ideal value added product. Um, is, is cannabis, you know, way more lucrative than hemp or is it just, it depends on the product? Anybody? Rick. <laughs> yeah, Rick. <laughs> uh, to that. Uh, well, we, we hope it'll be a lot more lucrative than hemp, um, but, uh, cannabis cultivation outdoors is very risky. Uh, and when I say cannabis, I include hemp. Uh, and as any hemp farmer in Vermont over the last three years knows, you know, uh, frost, mold, pests, floods, uh, the, that leaves about six plagues. Uh, anyway, um, uh, you know, the, the idea of getting one pound per plant uh, sometimes feels like a, a, a foolish pipe dream when you consider the crop loss. Really, to get into this business and, and bank on any less than you know, 25, 30% crop loss, you're setting yourself up for failure. Um, you know, so uh, the potential is there for lucrative. Uh, the other key thing to remember about outdoor is that um, given the nature of the product, its, it's density, um, most outdoor production is going to go for, for lower value extraction uh, into edibles um, and other and other processed products. Um, you know, <clears throat> so you know we, we hope that a lot coming from the outdoor would find a home in the premium flower market, 
but realistically, very little does. And uh, by contrast, on the indoor, especially if you use, you know, what, what folks call a sea of green method, almost all of that uh, would be premium. So, um, you know, I, 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 I don't think it's, uh, you know, hopefully it will be more, it should be at least somewhat more lucrative than hemp, but um, this is not, uh, the, the margins are going to be much smaller than what people might think. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Maddie? Yeah, can I just add on to that? Um, in addition to sort of the the factors that outdoor cultivators are going to face that Rick spoke to in terms of you know weather extremes um, and things like that, there's also huge risks to those cultivators in terms of uh, huge risks and barriers in terms of market access, which is why we've included all of these points around access um, in you know our testimony and our recommendations um, as the Cannabis Equity Coalition. Um, when you think about you know, the jump on the market that these multi-state operators have, as well as, you know, um, cannabis cultivation not being considered agriculture thus far, there are a lot of barriers in place. And so that's what really all of our recommendations are targeted toward um, removing some of those barriers and some of that market risk for these small cultivators so that they have a shot at, um, at making it in this marketplace. And, you know, big parts of that are allowing direct sales and allowing, um, you know, the sale of live plants to stay with cultivators and nursery licenses as opposed to wholesalers and retailers. So just this whole sort of constellation of recommendations that we're talking about is really um, our attempt at addressing these both kind of market and cultivation related risks. Yep. Uh, another question that kept coming up is uh, uh, people were supporting cannabis as being uh, farming. If you grow it, you're farming, uh, mainly for uh, at, to, to get around a lot of regulations. And what we found uh, in our testimony was that if the ag the ag agency regulates farming. And if we left it calling it farming, uh, they, they would be the ones that would regulate it on farms. And by them regulating it on farms and with all the federal programs that we have flow through Vermont, uh, they are subject to federal regulations. And one regulation uh, on the, to do this is that if, um, if they run into illegal products on a farm, they have to report it to, through the, to the agency and the agency has to report it to the feds. And what it would do is jeopardize many, <clears throat> many of our federal program for wallet, <clears throat> pardon me, for water quality, uh, direct uh, subsidies to farms in a variety of ways. And so we had to change that not to, uh, so that it wouldn't disallow all these other operations, but we loaded back in uh, a whole bunch of tax uh, exemptions, Act 250 exemptions, and things like that. So um, we've got we've got a long ways to go with this issue, and we have on the Senate side, seeing it's a Senate bill, we have very few days to get it across the finish line by crossover time. So a lot of, there's still gonna have to be a lot of work done uh, once this bill gets to the house uh, to make it become a reality. Uh, Graham? Bobby? Yeah, uh, yes. Um, I just wanted to let you know that Terry Norris has a question whenever it fits. No, I, I can give yeah. it to myself. Um, <laughs> you're, you're more than welcome, Terry, to ask it. I didn't see, well, I can't see your hand anyways, but um, but go ahead, Terry. Well, I was just gonna say, that's all quite very interesting, but you know, 
we represent a lot of people back home and here, regardless of what we think, there's a lot of people, you know, that aren't uh, necessarily in favor of widespread cannabis uh, growth and use in Vermont. So, you know, we can't just uh, use our own judgment all the time. Uh, just, a, just a statement, but it's well, not, not popular with everybody. Some people are just old fashioned. <laughs> Yeah, well, we all run into that, certainly, and the bigger the area we represent, <laughs> um, we all get pushback. But anyways, uh, we are bumping up against noon, and a lot of us have other meetings during the noon hour, but one more, uh, I see, is it Rich or Jen, I've got uh, your hand up, we'll, yeah, we'll quick certainly comment. don't want to. Um, I, I just wanted to react to the comment about, uh, you know, some members of the community are, you know, have reluctance about widespread cannabis cultivation. And, uh, you know, I, I realize it's not just about odor, for example, but, you know, I would point out that and maybe it's been stated already, if so, I apologize for repeating, but uh, hemp is already considered farming in the state of Vermont at any scale. Um, and I think we've all experienced now driving by a hemp farm in the summer, uh, you smell it. Um, yeah, there are wow. lots of other agricultural activities that we smell. Um, and in terms of wastewater impacts, traffic impacts, you know, outdoor cultivation of cannabis uh, is really just as light on the land as many other crops. Um, and there doesn't need to be a lot of traffic. So I, I know there's a whole host of issues and just broad stigma in general for cannabis. So I'm very sensitive and appreciate that remark. Uh, I, you know, I just, you know, encourage us to, you know, consider what we've actually learned over the last three years and have uh, in, in the state. Yeah. <clears throat> well, um, I, I hate to cut you folks off, but um, we are going to have to move on because quite a few of us have other meetings <laughs> during the noon hour. It never stops. Um, so uh, if any of you have testimony that you have written down and you could forward uh, if you would send that to Linda Lehman who works for both of our committees uh, she'll uh, certainly get that to all of us and and uh, hopefully we'll get one um, 188 through the process because that is going to open the door up to help uh, all your small cannabis uh, producers and and uh, we will work like heck to try to get it right but i'm sure we'll mess up on something uh so stay in touch and um you know uh come and visit with us anytime you want if you see things going bottom side up uh, get hold of us uh, and uh We'll try to right the boat uh, so we can keep it afloat. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your time this morning. Certainly appreciate it. And Maddie talks with us a lot and so doesn't Graham. So, you know, they're a good conduit to the committee and, and uh, let's just hope that we get uh, the best job done we can. So thank you all for- I'm happy to connect anybody here with Linda. If you do have written testimony to share, I can sort of be that liaison. And just want to say thank you again to the committee and all of you um, for coming in to testify today. Really appreciate the conversation. Yeah, thank you.